you know, but when you get the chance, hug up somebody, because everybody needs a hug. Amen. So, you're, he needs a hug right now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this great, great church family. So we're going to sing some awesome songs this morning, and let's sing them with a grateful and joyful spirit, because that way they mean something to us. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we don't have a, the words for you this morning, so if you'll stand and open your hymn books to hymn number four, we'll sing together to God Be the Glory. Yeah. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people
the lily of the valley. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care I need to grow. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. declaration about this grand old book. Are you ready? Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's holy word. It's given to teach me truth, to reprove me of sin, to correct me when I'm wrong and instruct me in what is right. It's a lamp into my daily walk and a light into my eternal path. And if I hide his words in my heart, then I will not sin against God. This is my Bible and it can change my life today. Amen. Amen. Have a seat if you would. It's good to see you. I'm looking around. I'm not seeing any first-time visitors. We have some visitors, but not first-timers. And it's good to see all of you here. Yeah. We had a great, uh, I just want to say this about Friday uh, night, our prayer meeting. We had a great prayer meeting. Yeah. I'm telling you what, it was great. What I, it, The prayers were just awesome. Uh, I was so moved. And uh, we had a great time. And I want to invite you back next Friday for our fervent Friday prayer meeting as we're getting ready for our tent revival that will start on September the 21st. We will be putting up the tent on September the 19th. That's a Saturday before we start at 9 o'clock up on the hill, way back up on the Riverside Adventure uh, RV Park where we set up. We'll be setting it up on uh, that Saturday, and we invite you to come out and help us. We need all the help we can get. Yeah. Also this week, WOM will be meeting Thursday night. Don't forget your shoebox items. Uh, if you haven't done that, go out and get that done. Now's a good time to get it. All the school supplies are on sale. And then also there's a, uh, oh, uh, this is Labor Day weekend. So uh, if you're laboring, we're going to let you have the, the day off. If you're not laboring, we'll, you, we'll join you in not laboring. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to take the night off. We won't have church here tonight. And this offices will be closed tomorrow in observance of Labor Day. We do need a nursery worker. If you have or you know somebody that could, would like to do that or has a, minister, has a heart for that kind of ministry, we are in need of a nursery worker. It is a paid position, but uh, we need you. If you are interested, make sure and see PD or drop by the office and pick up a uh, 
application. Um, what else? Anything else? Well, okay then. We'll just go right on then. Amen. We're gonna. I'll tell you what. I'm looking. I'm, I'm excited about the tent revival. I, uh, we're just kind of promoting it as that's our come out. If you if you're if you haven't come out yet, we're encouraging you to make that your come out uh, day to come out that Monday and be with us all week. I think once you've uh, once you've come to the camp meeting or the tent revival. You're going to want to be back in church. You're going to say, man, I've been missing this. And you, you've gotten to a place where maybe you don't realize how bad you miss it. But uh, you come and you get involved and I, all of a sudden you realize, man, I'm missing. I've been missing this. And um, so we're, we're having a good. Last Sunday was a great Sunday. We had one of the, we've had one of the best attendance since we started back uh, that we've had. And we're looking forward to today. Uh, this is a pretty good attendance for first service. Uh, especially when I get the choir out, get to see them out there, that'll help. And uh, some are still roaming in, and it's just good that uh, we're having church. Amen? Amen? Man, let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our churches. Did you see I posted online, uh, California has gone to attacking churches for having service. And uh, a lot of our churches out there are really suffering because of that. Um, and we're posting as much as we can about it just so we can pray for them. Uh, as they're trying to shut them down by force. I mean, literally by force, and it's just wrong. So um, be praying for that situation. Our country doesn't, we believe in freedom of religion, freedom of speech. We believe in freedom of religion. That's why we came, that's why our forefathers came here, and we're not going to lose that. Amen? Amen? Let's be faithful to pray for our country. All right, I think that's all I have. I can't think of anything else. So, Brother Jim, come lead us another song. Hymn number 122. Let's stand together and sing. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart everywhere. Tell me the story most precious. Sweet as that ever was heard. Oh. 
Be seated. I think I'm ready. He won't ever have to suffer like he once did Now a royal crown has replaced the thorns upon his head I won't see a bruised and battered face when his face I finally see He won't ever have to die again Once was enough for me Once was enough for me To see how much he loves me One lonely trip was all Amen. 
said an amen for that. For sure. Praise the Lord. Do you have your Bible with you? Take them out. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, if you will. We're going to cover a little bit more of it. We're going to finish that chapter one of these days. I promise we will. But why well, get through with something that's so good? Amen? I mean, it's just good. It's just good. Let's read our text, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump off into the sermon, okay? The text, beginning Romans 8, verses 31 and 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray that in the next several minutes, you'll take our hearts and minds to that place, to the throne room, to hear from you, Father, that, that special message of your love relationship with us. To realize, God, what you did for us and why you did it. And now, Father, to challenge us that we might live in a way that would demonstrate that love to others. We thank you for what you're going to do, and we praise you for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Paul began in the book of Romans by exposing our unrighteousness. And that led to the statement that we are all without excuse in Romans chapter 2. His explanation continued as he identified the problem that there is the law of God, that everyone is guilty of violating that law. And because we're all guilty, the only way we can be justified then is by God providing his righteousness to us by his grace. For the Jew, we found that he thought he was exempt from needing salvation because he was, he was of the seed of Abraham, he would say. But Paul revealed that the salvation that was promised to Abraham and Abraham's seed was provided through Jesus Christ, not through Abraham. In the life then, he goes on to tell us that is offered through Christ is one that provides peace with God through Christ. That even though death is the penalty on sin, Jesus died for us so we could have eternal life in him. Then having received eternal life through Christ, then we are no longer under the law, he said. However, our flesh is in conflict with our spirit when it comes to sin. He carries on. And tells us of the Spirit of God that's now living in us as saved to provide us victory over the flesh and to take out that arena of being un living under condemnation. And how in Romans 8 he began by stating that we are no longer under condemnation, but our salvation is secure and we don't need to be concerned because we've been called justified and destined or predetermined or predestinated to be glorified in God's divine plan as a result of our salvation. There is really nothing left to add at this point. As we come to this portion of the text, we realize that Paul has carried us all the way from a lost condition to the saved condition, and then he's backed it up with the fact that we are, have the Holy Spirit, and we've been predestined to be glorified in Christ, and someday we will be glorified, and that's coming. It's a promise from God. Our salvation is secure. There is nothing else to add to this salvation. We could end right here. We've gone as far as we can go with salvation. It's done. It's a done deal. If you're still struggling with your salvation, go back and read chapters 1 through 8 and grab hold of all the truths that Paul has taught us about salvation. But now, Paul comes to a portion of text, these last few verses of chapter 8, and he, he presents six different questions. And I think it's amazing because in giving us those six questions, he's really praising God. It's questions that have answers. It's questions that we know the answer to. And that's Paul. 
John MacArthur calls it the doxology that Paul is giving. Uh, Paul's doxology or his song or his praise uh, to God. And it will come in the form of these six questions. So we're going to begin this morning. We're going to look at several. We're going to look at a few of these, but just we're going to look at verses uh, 31 and 32. And that's probably as far as we're going to get this morning. But here's the first question. What shall we say to these things? I've just listed what Paul's brought us through. Chapters 1 through 8. What shall we say of these things? What shall we say of this salvation that Paul has described to us? What can we add to that? Is there anything else we could add? Many have, have, have a hard time understanding how salvation can be all by grace. They suffer, they suffer with this idea that somehow or another, uh, God says he'll give us eternal life, but it's not really eternal. That God will forgive all our sins, but not all our sins in the future. That God will uh, uh, provide a security for us that says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, but the seal might be broken in some way. And I have a problem with people that go there because God's so plain about this truth that our salvation is completely by grace. Amen. They feel that God can give us this salvation by His grace, but then many of them say, but we've got to do things in order to keep it. That's what we've got to do. We've got to continue to do these things in order to keep. God gives us salvation, we understand, by grace, free and clear. But then we don't get to keep it free and clear by God's grace. It's only by our works. It just doesn't make sense. Let me give you three passages of Scripture that will back, back this up. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. There's the condition. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. That's salvation. Putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he says, who he says he is and what he says he can do. Putting our faith in that. To those who've done that, he said, hath everlasting life. You know, I struggle when people say, well, I don't believe, you, I don't believe God can give you, you know, uh, eternal security, meaning that once you get saved, that you're going to be saved forever. I mean, that's not true. But then why does he call it everlasting life? Why does he call it eternal life? If God didn't mean eternal or everlasting, why would he use those terms? And I'm going to tell you something. If God says he's going to give me something forever, I just believe God can do that. Amen? My God's big enough to do that. So he says, first of all, I, I'll give you, you have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Another promise from the scriptures, shall not. That's a promise. It doesn't say hope you won't. It says shall not. It won't happen. You shall not come in condemnation, but are passed from death to life. Why can't we just accept the scripture for what it says? You know, I, I, people say, well, that's a Baptist doctrine, that once saved, always saved. Thing. No, it's not. It's scriptural. Don't you see that? It's everlasting. We will not come into condemnation. We're passed from death to life. How, can, how else can you read that but that it's eternal? It's forever. Let me give you another passage. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. And if by grace, if we're saved by grace, then is it no more works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Paul says here in Romans 11, he said, if it's going to be by grace, then it needs to be by grace. If you're going to add works in there, then it's no longer grace. If I'm going to give you something as a gift, you can't pay me because if you do, then it's not a gift. If I expect anything in return, it's not a gift. It's a gift. So Paul says, if it's by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if you say that it's going to be of works, then it is no more, it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. If you're going to work for your salvation, then it can't be grace that gives it to you. It's one or the other. And I tell you what, I'll choose grace every time. Because I cannot work myself into salvation. Let me give you another passage, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 
who has saved us, talking about the Lord Jesus, talking about God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. My salvation is so sure that it was even secured before God ever created anything. And if God had predestined me to be saved from before the world began, if it was decided before the world began that I was going to be saved, let me tell you, how long do you think it's going to last? I mean, good night. It's based upon God's grace, period, end of sentence, that's it. So what purpose could we have to this truth? Well, instead of always questioning this truth, we should live by faith in the fact of our salvation. We should live in the truth of this salvation that's been given to us. If you truly are saved, if you've come into that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you ought to walk in the security of that relationship. It's sure. It's done. I married Ruby Newton. She was Ruby Black then. On March the 12th, 1971. Be 50 years next March. Hallelujah. When I gave my heart and life to her, it, she should be able to walk out of that chapel knowing that I will never, ever leave her. And that's between two human beings. When my God in heaven, who's the creator of all, who is the sovereign over all, sovereign over all tells me that I can have everlasting life and that he's given me this grace before the world, or, or, he's given me this grace before the world began. I need to be able to walk in that confidence that I'm saved. Yes. Just like my wife walks in the confidence of that relationship I promised her over 50 years ago. What would it cost you to always be questioning your salvation? Are you one of those that maybe you're always wondering, I, I wonder if I'm really saved? I, boy, I. I I hope I'm saved. Man, I know a preacher said that today, and I, I hear what he's saying, but, you know, when I walk out, I just keep thinking, maybe, what if I'm not saved? What, what it, what? I know I prayed. I know I received Christ. I know I've done everything, everything the Bible says to do. I've done. I, I don't know what else I could do. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if I'm really saved. Well, let me tell you three things you lose when you always question your salvation. Number one, you lose your peace. Amen. With our salvation comes peace. Romans 5, 1 and 2 tells us we have the peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. If you're not saved, you don't have peace with God because God is your enemy. God, you are an, you are an enemy with God. You're, you're a child of wrath. You're not a child of the king. And so there's a battle going on. But once you give your heart and life to Christ, once you're justified by faith, you have peace with God. The peace is there through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's where God wants. That's the peace that we're supposed to have in this salvation we have. Peace. If you're not experiencing that peace because you're always questioning your salvation, settle it. Be done with it. Amen. Stop letting Satan use that to keep you from growing. I'll get to that in a second. The second thing you lose is your security. Living in a constant fear of rejection from God, how can you have any kind of security? You're always thinking, I, well, 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 I, may, I, may, I may have lost it. I may have lost it today. I may have... <clears throat> your security, you, just, you live in constant fear. I would. If I didn't know I was saved, I'd live in constant fear. In some way, I could do something to lose it. I don't want to do that. I like what John Yates said. It's kind of a comical way of looking at it but so true he said if you thought you could lose your salvation he said if i thought i could lose my salvation i'd always be i'd be constantly in prayer lord forgive me lord come in my heart lord come in my heart lord forgive me lord i'm really receive you i pray for you lord I, I believe you i believe you and not letting any kind of sin seep in at all because if one sin seeps in i've lost my salvation 
He said, I'd be so caught up in praying that prayer and trying to stay connected to God that I might not pay attention to what's going on. He said, can you imagine? Here I am in the city, and all of a sudden I step up to a curb, and I step off the curb, and I turn and look, and here comes a bus, 50 miles an hour, coming at me like this. And all of a sudden my prayers turn from God help me to, oh, blank. And I'm lost forever. God doesn't work that way. There's security in our salvation. And you ought to walk in that. And I'll tell you a third thing you lose is growth. I've used this illustration so many times, but it's so true. If you're all the time walking around wondering if you've really been born, <laughs> you're not going to grow much. Amen. I wonder if I've been born again. I wonder if I really am born again. I wonder if I really am a child of God. I wonder if I... All the time you're doing that is time that God would want you to be growing in Him. But instead, you're just stuck at your birth trying to figure out if you really were born or not. Get past that. So our response to this truth should be to walk in our peace, to enjoy our security, and grow in Christ. He goes on in our text and he says, If God be for us, who can be against us? I love that. Don't you love that? Here's the sum of it all. If, if what we've learned in Romans chapter 1 through 8 is salvation, and it's sure, and it's non-condemning, if then we have this salvation, if God is truly for us as he says he is, then who can be against us? If God be for us. If there's one thing we have seen in all of this, Romans 1 through 8, is that God is for us. We were lost in our sin, but God was for us and provides a way to save us. God is for us in making salvation all by grace and not by works because He knew we couldn't work our way in. God is for us by the security of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> that He's given us to protect us from ever being lost again. God is for us by the promised inheritance we have in Christ Jesus. God is for us by providing the victory over the flesh. Listen, if there's one thing we've learned in these first eight chapters is that God is for us. God is for you. He hasn't let you down. He hasn't left you alone. Oh, you may feel that way sometimes, but let me tell you something. God didn't move. That's right. You did. And he's just waiting for you to come back. Like the father to the prodigal son. He's looking for you every day to come running down that road. Well, if God then is for us, who can be against us? And literally, because we're talking about salvation, the, the idea is who or what could ever take away our salvation? Who could be against us? David writes in Psalm 27, verses 1 through 4. This is a great passage. David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's the one that gives me guidance. He's the one that provides my, uh, my, uh, my path. He's my salvation. Why should I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? I mean, if I'm putting my faith and trust in God who created everything, who is by his own nature described as omnipotent, meaning all-powerful, then why should I ever be afraid of what anyone can do to me? Verse 2 goes on and says, When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, though a host came and should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. What? That Jesus, that God is my light, my salvation, my strength. He provides everything I need in the midst of our, my foes. I don't need to be afraid. I can walk in that confidence because God is who He says He is and He can do what He said He can do. The last verse of Psalm 27, verse 4 says this, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and then carve his temple. The, more, the closer we get to him, when it talks about here, I desired to be in the house of the Lord, I want you to understand, he's not talking about a church house. He's talking about a relationship with the Father. He's talking about getting to know God. The closer I am with God, the more in touch I desired of the Lord that I would seek after that dwelling place in his presence all the days of my life. Why? Because there's where you behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire of his temple. I think that's why we, uh, we, we need to have a daily time of devotion, a daily time of being alone with God. Yes, I want us to be all day long that way. But if you don't set aside a time, if you don't require yourself to set aside a distinct time that this is God's time for my life and allow him in that moment to just, just to walk in his presence, to just stand there in his presence sometimes, to listen to what he has to say, to pray and talk to him about your day. Listen, you've got to have that or you're going to wind up failing all the time. Then... Who can, who can take, who can, who's against us? Who could ever cause us to lose this? No one can remove our non-condemnational status since God is higher than his creation and has called us to glory because my faith and my salvation is wrapped up in the eternal, sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient God. No one on this earth because they all walk under him. No, no thing on this earth can do it because everything was created by him. So there's nothing that can interfere with my relationship with God. Then some would say, well, Jim, wait a minute. Can't God, being God, take away our salvation if he wants to? You know, that's a great question. That's kind of like asking, is there, is there, if God's all powerful, is there a rock he could make that he could not lift? Those are those unlearned questions that he warns us not to deal with. But some will say, can't God, if God wanted to, could he take away our salvation? Could he? What could ever make God turn his back on us? Let me ask you two, a couple of things. Once you're saved, God saved you by the cost of the most precious thing he has, his son. And if God is going to invest in you, the most precious thing he has by offering his son as a, as a sacrifice for you, what makes you think he would ever give, give you up if he's willing to do that for you? Amen. There's no way. There's just no way. Why would he ever give you up if he's invested the most precious thing he has? He would never do that. The last part of verse, or verse 32, let's look at that last verse. There's a proof of his commitment to us. He has spared not his own son, that's what I just said, but delivered him up for us all. Let's talk about that for a second. God was willing to sacrifice his son in order to save you, to save me. And if you're like me, you go, God, you got the bad end of this deal. Amen. You got the bad end of this deal, sacrificing your son to save me. You got the worst end of this deal. But boy, I am sure glad he did. Because without that, I'd have no salvation. But notice in our text, it said, God delivered him up. I want to give you three things. First of all, he gave him up on purpose. In Acts chapter 2.23, it says, him, Jesus... Jesus being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified him. Peter's preaching to the Sanhedrin, to the Jews, and he says to them, you may have killed him, but you couldn't have done it if God hadn't wanted you to. It was determined, by, delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was not a mistake that Jesus was crucified. It was not a mistake that they came and took him and hung him on a cross. It was predetermined by God himself. People will say, well, who crucified Jesus? It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't the Romans. It was God the Father that crucified him. He put him on that cross. It was on purpose he did that. Why? So he could save you and me. That's why. 
And then it pleased the Lord. Isaiah 53, 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, who shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was on purpose, and it was also pleasing to the Father. You say for the Father to crucify his Son, it was pleasing. That's what the Bible says. Can we understand that? I don't think we can even begin to understand that. That demonstrates the love God has for you and me. That goes beyond any kind of love that we have on this earth. To be willing to pleasingly offer his Son that we could have everlasting life. And then I want to tell you about the sacrifice Jesus. He approached it with joy. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus joyfully went to the cross for you. Joyfully. Because he knew what he was doing. He was purchasing for you and me our salvation. It brought him joy to know that he was fulfilling the Father's purpose, the Father's desire in dying for us so that God could save us. He was committed to us. Verse 32 goes on and says, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? On top of God giving us his Son, he gives us all things. First, or 2 Peter 1 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain, pertain unto life and godliness. Not only did he give us his son, but he gives us all things. He gives us our inheritance that makes us children of God. And then he gives us everything that we need by his divine power. The Lord has way too much invested in you and I. For him to turn his back on us. Amen. He has invested everything. From the very, before the world ever began, he was investing in you. And throughout all this history, God has been nothing but investing in you. That's all. His, his only thought is for you and him to walk in a relationship. That's all his thoughts are. Everything that's been done is provided for that relationship so that you would come to him and he would come and y'all would have a relationship with one another. That's his desire. He's invested. How shall he not with him also freely give us? If he's done all of that for you, why would he withhold anything from you? He won't. God has done all of this to invest in your life. Now here's the question. What have you invested in Him? You see, He doesn't fail in His investment portfolio. You open it up and you just find your name there. That's all you find. That's all He's invested in. You. What is your life invested in? How much of you is invested in this relationship with God? How much are you determined to have this relationship with God? We know God's all in. What about you? How invested are you in this relationship? There was a little sign on a, on a financial store in Palestine one year. I come through there. I preached a message on it. It said this. I hope I can get it right. Without investment, there are no dividends. Without investment... There are no dividends. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're not going to invest in the Lord, why do you expect so much from Him? People get angry with the Lord. They get mad. God did this. God did that. God didn't do that. God didn't do that. What, what have you invested in this relationship? He's invested everything. We need to check our investment portfolio. Amen. We need to see what we've been investing in. Because God wants us to be invested in Him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank You this morning for this message. I pray that we might understand the importance of what You've told us. Look what You've done for us. 
Look what you did in saving us. Look at how sure this is because you gave the best you had. Your son, your only son. What have we given? What have we done? We received your gift by grace and then we go off doing our own thing. Lord, help us this morning to realize that there's so much more in this relationship. If only we would invest our time and energy into learning of you, walking with you, living with you, learning of you. Oh, my goodness. Let us see this morning what we're missing. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me just ask you a question this morning. Number one, are you saved? Do you know if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven? Have you experienced that wonderful uh, testament of salvation that God says He provides for you free and clear by grace? It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, the Bible says. It's a gift. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. But He also says that even in our sin, He loved us. And died for us. And if we'll put our faith and trust in what He's done for us, He promises us eternal life. Do you have that? Have you stepped into that relationship with Him? If you haven't, this morning will be a great morning for you to receive Christ. How do I do that? By simply bowing before Him and saying, Dear, dear Father, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I've failed so many different ways. But from what I hear, what I hear from the Word of God is that you love me and that even in my sin, you died for me. And in your resurrection, you promised me eternal life. And Father, this morning I come to you and I ask you, Lord, give me that eternal life that you promised even right now. I may not understand it, but I'm going to accept it by faith that you're going to give that to me. And I'm going to walk in the confidence that I've received that from you and you only. If you pray that kind of prayer and you've asked Christ to come into your life and save you, I hope you'll let somebody know. Call me this week. Tell me, preacher, this week I asked Christ into my life. If you're here in the building and you've done that this morning, stick around after church and let's talk for just a minute about what you need to do next. Where do you go with this salvation you received? But dear child of God, you're the one for which this message is built for. This is who God wants to speak to this morning. He's declared to us the freedom of our salvation by the grace he gives it to us. He's determined that it's eternal. He won't ever take it away from us. But now he would ask, if I'm willing to do all of that for you, what can, I, what can I expect from you? If I'll invest all I have for you, what kind of investment will you give to have that relationship with me? That's for you today. Father, I pray this morning that we will take to heart what you've asked us. And let us, Father, consider where we are. Not leave here the way we came in, but with the thought, what am I doing? Where am I in my relationship with God? How close do I walk to Him? How much do I know of Him? And may we be changed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me just tell you tonight, I'll be, uh, tonight we will not have church tonight, by the way. Uh, it's uh, Labor Day weekend, so I'm going to take the night off. And then, um, but we will be back Wednesday night with a meal. And uh, we've had two great meals and had a great time. And you're welcome to come at 530, eat with us. And then at 630, we have our evening Bible study in the book of Acts. Don't forget WOM's Thursday night. And then be praying with us Friday night. We have our fervent Friday prayer meeting. Invite you to come. Be with us at 630. It's not a long meeting. We will have a nursery available if you have small children, uh, small nursery age children. The older children are staying in here and praying with us, and they're enjoying that. So I hope that you'll, uh, you'll do that as well. 
All right, let's stand. We'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. And if you don't mind, just for a moment, it's taken clean around you uh, like we normally do, and then we'll be gone. All right, Father, we thank you again for this day. We pray, Lord, you might bless and use, Father, what we've heard to be more like you, more like the Son. That's your desire. Might that be our desire as well. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.